Uh, final question this morning. What are the key things? What are the key things we take away from this passage that changes our relationship with God? <laughs> it's not enough just to hear some bits and pieces and think, oh, that was very interesting, Pastor. Pastor got very excited this morning. It's not enough. If it doesn't actually leave you changed, you've not heard God's word. Do you hear me? If it doesn't leave you changed, you've not heard God's word. This is GBC Web TV on the internet at gbcweb.tv. Welcome to Greenford Baptist Church in West London. Here you can watch inspired biblical teaching and find out how to apply God's word to your everyday lives. Uh, last week I gave a really detailed introduction to Revelation. I'm not going to repeat that today. Uh, we've had a couple of technical difficulties this week. It will be on the website within the next couple of days. Uh, so if you weren't here last week and you want to have a listen to that or see it, it will be there uh, within the next 48 hours. I just want to recap just one or two headlines from last week. This was a letter written by John to churches that he knew, and it was a letter that was sent. It's not a, a theological treatise, it was a letter, and it was intended to be read out to the congregation during worship. So as they, as we have this morning, celebrated the living God, in the middle of that, this letter would have been read out. Read out to Christians, believers who were subject to discrimination and to harassment. If they were brought to court, if they refused to curse Christ, among other things, they would be tortured and they would be killed. That was the social context. And we saw last time that the core theme of Revelation is that whatever the appearance may be, however things look, God is in control. However it feels... However it seems, God is in control. That's the theme. And we're going to pick that up as we uh, begin this morning. So, Revelation chapter 1, we're beginning at verse 9. To explain, if you're here in uh, one of my teaching sessions for the first time, um, uh, over the next uh, 55 minutes, there are going to be times when I'm going to stop and ask questions. And uh, when I stop and ask questions, these aren't preachers' rhetorical questions. I'm actually going to be wanting some response from people. And uh, with the various things we're going to look at and talk about together as we uh, work through this passage. So, Revelation chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, Patmos was a small island. It was about 16 square miles in total. It was a, a fortified island. And the Roman authorities used it as a place to store troublemakers, to take them out of circulation. It was the equivalent of internal exile. They were sent there, uh, they couldn't do a lot, there was not much communication from there, so that's where they sent them. And John was there because the government saw him as a troublemaker. He was a troublemaker because he preached the good news and he gave testimony to Jesus. And the important thing as he begins to share here, I share your suffering. The same suffering that was going on for the people in these churches that he knew so well, that he's writing to, he is sharing the reader's suffering. He is there in Patmos. And what's his response? His response to that suffering, he describes as being patient endurance. That's going to be a theme for some of the things this morning. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom, and patient endurance for the hours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos 
because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So let's just begin. Uh, I'm going to talk about patient endurance in a few moments, but let's just think about ourselves for a moment. <coughs> what does it mean for us in, in the context when there is suffering and difficulty for us? What does this response of patient endurance mean in our context? What does it mean for us? Some of you will have been in situations, you may not be now, but historically you've been in situations where because of your faith things have been difficult. What does it mean in that context for patient endurance? How does that work out? Robson. Rest in Christ. Rest in Christ. Is Matt? I, for myself, uh, I would understand this. Whenever there is a hardship, difficulties, I give space to God to work rather than myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you, uh, there is two things I, I felt in this situation. In the world, you will feel like abnormal. They, they think you are not normal. Because in hardship, the true believer will connect with the Christ. So normal reaction to be, for example, angry, to swear, to do something bad, revenge. So worldly people, they think about the real believer of the Christ that they are not normal. Ah, yes, very good. They won't understand connection, this vertical connection with the Christ. When you are in problem, if you connect with him, he will calm you down, definitely. Okay, thank you very much, very good. I saw someone's hand over here. <coughs> Whatever we are going to, Christ has promised never to forsake us or never to leave us, and he's there with us. Mm. He'll help us, give us strength. Amen. Amen. Just a few more. Okay. Stand firm on God's word. Okay. Very good. Wait until you get direction from God. Mm -hmm. It could mean perseverance in hope for victory in faith. Mm -hmm. I like that. Perseverance in hope. Last one. I think in our context today, we've got used to such an instant world that we need to learn patience and endurance and waiting longer than we might expect. Mm. The whole thing of patient endurance, because uh, Chris is right, we, we live in a world where there is such uh, an expectation of things instantly, faster and faster and faster. And in this, in this world here that John is writing in and writing to us, this whole thing of waiting, is Matt said that, making space for God, waiting. It, it means holding on in faith to the reality of God's kingdom, even when you can't see it. It's about holding on in faith. Faith is about holding on to things that you can't see. So it's holding on in faith. It's trusting God in the reality of God's kingdom, in the reality of God's rule in the world, even though you can't see it. And it's also about keeping in focus. And this is a theme that's going to run through the book of Revelation. It's keeping in focus the fact that God is going to triumph. I said to you last time, I don't know if you're one of those people that likes seeing how a book's going to work out. You read the end bit before you read much of the book. And if some of you like that, it's a great thing to do with Revelation. Because <laughs> it's got a fantastic ending. Some difficulties on the route, but a fantastic ending. So it's keeping hold of the fact, of the reality, that God is going to triumph over all evil. Without exception, God is going to triumph. And we keep that as our focus. No matter what's going on in our lives, in our situations, in our circumstances, it's trusting that reality. We hold on in faith, God's kingdom, God's rule, God's ultimate triumph. And this, this is, I've got two quotes here. One uh, from a guy called Beale. He wrote this, endurance for Christians, for you and for me. Endurance is part of the process of conquering. That's really important because so often we think that it's about, you know, we pray, we're in a difficult situation, we pray and we expect God to spring us out of the difficult situation. That somehow God's just going to snatch us out and move us somewhere else. That isn't how life is. That isn't what God promises us. 
But as we stay and as we endure in the situation, it's in that that we conquer, that we overcome as we stay in that situation. And uh, this guy I quoted last week with the, uh, for me, uh, slightly strange name of boring. He said this, the Christian life is a tension-filled unity of tribulation and kingdom. The Christian life is a tension-filled unity of tribulation, that's of difficulties, of problems on one side, and of God's kingdom on the other. And they're both there, and they're both in our lives. And there is that tension that is there between the two. That's the reality that we live in. We live in the fact that God's kingdom has come, but that the other kingdom has not gone yet. <laughs> we live in that tension in between the two. There's tribulation because one kingdom has not gone, but there also is God's kingdom has come, and we live in that tension between those two. That is where we live out our Christian life, and as we endure, so we conquer. On the Lord's day, says John, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. The Lord's Day almost certainly refers to a Sunday. On a Sunday, John would have wanted to be, his heart would have wanted to be with the believers in the area that was at that time known as Asia, which we saw last time is not quite what we would call Asia today. Asia, the Roman province of Asia, was the west, what is today the west coast of Turkey. So he would have wanted to be with the churches that he knew in that area. So it's a painful time for him on the Lord's Day when he is in exile, he is in banishment. And yet... There he's caught up in the spirit. In the spirit refers back to the experience of the Old Testament prophets, particularly Ezekiel, also Daniel, that, that whole idea of be, being caught up in the spirit. And he heard a voice. And when he first hears the voice, it's a voice like a trumpet. And that's a reference back to Exodus. We're going to be going backwards and forwards into the Old Testament on several occasions uh, this morning, and also it'll be a, a pattern as we work through. Exodus chapter 19, you don't need to turn to it, but if you want to, it's page 77, Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. The context is that the people of God are at Mount Sinai. And on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. And Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The voice like a trumpet refers back to the trumpet announcing the fact that God was about to speak. That God's people should pay attention. In this context, in Exodus, they should gather together. Here it's to John, voice like a trumpet. God's people to whom this letter is being sent, pay attention. God is about to speak. The trumpet is there. And the letter is sent to seven churches. Now, we know that seven is a symbolic number. We know that there are a lot more than seven churches in the area. We know the names of a number of the other churches. Why seven? Seven stands for completeness. And what it's saying is that this letter is being sent to the church both then, at that time, and the church for all time, including us.
I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. <laughs> Now, when you read Revelation, when you listen to Revelation, it's really important to understand that nothing is merely descriptive. This is not about the colour of this person that was like a son of man's hair. It's not about his dress for the day. Each of these things, as the people listen to this, and in their mind, they saw these images. They would have known, that first audience, exactly what each of these images meant. They would have known where they came from, and they would have known what they stood for. They're all signifiers. And let me just talk about the fire exit for a moment. If I said to you, where is the fire exit? You'd say, it's over there. How do you know it's over there? Because there's a sign. Now, if there's a fire, do you go to the fire exit sign? To the door. No, ah, thank you. You don't go to the fire exit sign. You don't come rushing over here, get a ladder, and try and climb up to the fire exit sign. Because the sign is not the thing. The sign points to the thing. Can we say that together? The sign is not the thing. The sign points to the thing. So it points, in our context here, where the fire exit is. But the fire exit, the thing that says fire exit, is not the fire exit, it's a sign. And you know that immediately. So when you look at this, you need to understand that these images are not the thing, they point to the thing. So each of these descriptions here points to something that's being revealed about Jesus. So let's have a look at where some of these images come from. And I'm going to put the references on the screen so that uh, I don't have to keep repeating them. But if you turn back to the book of Daniel, and I'd like you all to do this, because I'd like you all to read it together. Uh, it's page 892, if you've got one of our church Bibles. If not, you don't know where Daniel is, every Bible's got an index. <laughs> Recommend the index, it's very helpful. Daniel chapter 7. And we're going to read these uh, <clears throat> verses that you can see on the screen here. This is not all the background. Um, I'm going to give you some other references as we go through, but this is the primary background to the image that John is describing. So beginning at verse 9. <clears throat> chapter 7. You there? Still rummaging. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Stop down to verse 13. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority 
glory, sovereign power, all peoples, nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Over the page, chapter 10, beginning at verse 4, over two pages perhaps. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen, with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his, brong, his arms and legs with the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale. I was helpless. And then I heard him speaking. And as I listened, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up, trembling. You see straight away where a number of these images have come from. So let's work through and look at what they stand for. So first of all, Someone like a son of man, and we saw that's a direct quote from Daniel, is dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet. Now, the word there that's used for robe is a very specific word. It's not just your general robe you might go and get from Marks and Spencers or somewhere else. This word robe only has one meaning, and it is the robe worn by the high priest. It's a particular Greek term that's used um, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament and it is used for the high priest. So this one like a son of man, the first thing we learn about him is that he is a high priest. And he's got a golden sash around his waist. Golden sash, that's a signifier of government and authority. If in John's day you saw someone approaching you with a golden sash, you would stand to attention because this man had power. <coughs> This is someone who's in authority. So this is about governing. The third thing, his head and hair are white like wool. That signifies the fact that this person, like the Son of Man, is God. We saw that in Daniel, the Ancient of Days. It signifies, identifies him as God. Blazing eyes, bronze feet, double-edged sword are all images of power and of judgment. All in different aspects of that. About God's word proceeding forth and achieving everything that it seeks to achieve because it's like a double-edged sword cutting through. Uh, same with the bronze feet and the uh, blazing eyes, or the eyes like blazing fire. These are all signifiers of power and judgment. And the voice like rushing water, well, we're not going to read it. It comes from Ezekiel 43 and verse 2, and it's an identifier saying that God is speaking. So we have this image that is there. Now let's think for a moment. I, I did an exercise here some years ago. I'm not going to do it this morning. Um, but I asked, it was in an evening, and I asked the whole congregation to lie on the ground face down. It was optional. I said, it's not compulsory, but I want to encourage you to do that. Some people thought that I'm mad. Others knew that I was mad. So, but they all laid down on the ground. And I said, I'm going to speak to you. And I actually read this passage with some explanation about what the things meant. I want you just to imagine for a moment. 
just call up in your mind. Not just the image. I don't want you just to see a, a picture of someone uh, with all these physical attributes. It's look, it looks a bit odd. <laughs> but this is a revelation of what the risen, exalted Jesus is like. You know, when Jesus walked around on the earth, John used to snuggle up to Jesus. He used to actually rest his head on Jesus' chest. This is not the sort of Jesus that you snuggle up to. This is not the sort of Jesus you just casually walk up to. So what's your reaction? What do you think? What do you feel? What does it mean for you? What's your response to Jesus being pictured like this? What's your reaction this morning? What does it mean to you? today. The risen, exalted Jesus, priest, governing, God, power, judgment. What comes to the surface? What feelings? What thoughts? It's not just about uh, what clever ideas we've got, but how we feel as well. I often view God as my father, and I sometimes forget that I'm supposed to fear him, and this image has really made me kind of like the more I think about the image and what's actually visible in it, I'm getting more of the taste of fear of God. And once you get that, your relationship changes and gets better and deeper. Thank you. That's great. Anybody else? Joan? Just the one word, unapproachable, I think. Mm -hmm. What else? What other feelings, thoughts? Belinda? Or... Or. Or. Mm. Denzel. A mixture of, of awe and a sense of fear and the sense of reverence, but also an element of reassurance that God is so powerful. There's a reassurance in it as well. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, squeezing past you, Janet. It's an amazing, it's just an amazing God, and that's it. We sang that song early this morning, didn't we? Indescribable. Indescribable. I'm just going to be very rude and walk past you. I've often thought of God as being like, really meek, giving in to people and stuff, but that makes me think that he's really strong and um, he can do really powerful things. Mm. It's a very important observation because so often we think about Jesus, don't we? Gentle Jesus meek and mild. This Jesus is not gentle. <laughs> this is not Jesus meek. This is risen, exalted Jesus. For me, as I, uh, as I said last week, this is one of my favourite passages in the whole of the Bible. And uh, for me, there are two things that sit side by side here. There is this awesome, powerful, dreadful, uh, side of, of God, just the awesomeness of God, and the, the fact that nobody, nothing can stand before him, just that judgment, just those burning eyes that see through absolutely everything, and the power that is there, and that word, that double-edged sword, that sense of that word that is not resistible. Everything that God says, every word that goes forth, it achieves its purpose. But at the same time, this Jesus came to speak to John. He didn't come to kill John. He didn't come to wipe him off the face of the planet. He came to speak to John and to speak to us. To talk to you this morning. That's why that picture, that image is there. So there is this sense of God's transcendence to use a Big fancy theological word. God's transcendence, God's awesomeness, God's otherness. But at the same time, to use another theological word, there's God's imminence, his closeness. He's here. He's among us. And depending on the situation I'm in, different feelings sometimes come to the surface. Sometimes it's feelings of, of just of fear, of awe, of terror. Sometimes it's feelings of comfort because you need 
someone like this on your side when things are going bad. <laughs> you know, this is, forget heroes on the television with somebody with all superhuman powers. Some of you may be watching that program. Uh, you know, this has got, this one like the Son of Man, he's got everything. Absolutely everything. And he's walking among the lampstands. Now, verse 20 tells us that the lampstands stand for the churches. Now, in the Old Testament temple, there were lampstands. And the priest's role, or one of the priest's role, it was a job of the priest, was to make sure that the light of the lampstand never went out. Because the light was symbolic of God's presence. So the priest tended to the lampstand. The, the priest refreshed the oil, trimmed the wick, made sure the light from the lampstand continued all the time. We, Greenford Baptist Church, are imaged in this story as being a lampstand, standing here in West London. Shining out light, light indicating God's presence, drawing people to God. And walking among the lampstands is one like a son of man. As we've talked about just now. So what does it mean for us as a lampstand? Green for Baptist Church. Or if you're visiting today from a different church, the church that you come from, your lampstand that you identify with. What does it mean to be a lampstand <laughs> and to have Jesus like this around the lampstand? What does it mean for us in practice? deep theological truths about the then, but what does it mean for us now? I think it means God's with us. God's with us, the church's future plans, and it's not about a building, it's about the individuals that make the church, and each of us has a role to play. And... There's a responsibility in that image, but there's also hope in that whatever situation you're going through, you're not going through it alone because the rest of the church is standing with you. And there's also a responsibility of turning it outside. And it's your responsibility to reach the people who don't yep. know what the lamp means. Joe, can you reach over? I'll, go on, I'll let you have um, it. <laughs> it just made me think of the righteousness of God and this responsibility we have to maintain our witness. Um, as representatives of him on earth. Yeah. So that the lampstand, the image of the lampstand is, is about, about light and about the fact that we are there to be light. We are there to be, to bring God's presence out into the community. But that Jesus is there trimming the wick. Jesus is there giving the oil. So this is about trimming the wick. You could talk about being disciplined. Could be an image for taking off dead bits for uh, making sure that things are as they ought to be. The oil is about supplying all that we need to stay bright and glowing in our community. God's presence shining forth through us, out through us, into the community. And in his hand, he's got seven stars. Oh, incidentally, the fact he's walking around means he's watching. Some people have got a, a, a plaque in their house. Uh, I may not quote it exactly, so you, you might be able to help me along here. It says, uh, uh, in this house, Christ is the unseen guest at every meal, the unseen listener to every conversation. Yeah? Every time we're together at church, <laughs> Jesus is walking around among us. He's watching. He's listening. Every conversation, every action, he is here among us. And there's this image here that, that in his right hand, 
he's got seven stars. Now that doesn't mean a lot in our culture. It would have meant two things straight away to the listeners. This image of, of seven stars was part of the imagery that was associated with the worship of Caesar. Remember I said last time that the, uh, the Roman cult portrayed Caesar, the, the governor, as being divine, as being God. And part in that worship of that, there is this image of these seven stars that is there. It also was part of the imagery of a pagan cult that was around at the time, known as the Mithras cult. And it was a part of their thing as well. They, they had this sort of belief that the stars somehow controlled things, controlled destiny. A bit like some people think with horoscopes. So what is this saying? It's saying actually it's not in the hands of the state. It's not in the hands of the stars. It's in the hands of Jesus. <laughs> because he's actually holding the stars in his hand. So it's not about the state, Caesar. It's not about him controlling destiny. It's not about pagan beliefs. It's not about the fates. It's not about evil spirits. It's not about ancestors. It's not about anything else that stands there that controls our destiny. Our destiny is in the hands of Jesus. Everything is in his hands. Other forces may seek to come against us. Other forces may seek to make our lives difficult. Other things may oppress us, but our destiny is in the hands of Jesus. No one else, nowhere else. It's in Jesus' hands. So he stands there, pictured with the seven stars. So we don't need to fear. We don't need to fear the state. We don't need to fear pagan religion. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And I hold the keys of death and of Hades. The first and the last is the same as we explored the image last week. I am the Alpha and the Omega, being the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. I'm the first and the last implied and everything in between. I'm the beginning and the end and the middle and one-third through and two-thirds through. Wherever you are in the story, he is. He is. He is. I am... It's the name Yahweh. I am who I am. I am who I will be. I was what I am. I am who I will be. All of that is all mixed up there, and it's all in this here. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And it's a linear view of history. I said this last time. History, in my opinion, is his story. That works well in English. doesn't work so well in other languages. But it's his story. He started it off. He created time. He knows where we are in the story. He's taking it to its completion. And there are no circles that we're going in. It's in a straight line from here to there, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. And he's doing it. He's taking it all the way through from the beginning to the end. And you are in the story. You are there. You are there. And he is going to see it through. Not only that. Now don't forget these people were facing the possibility of death at any time. So what does he say? He says, I was dead. But I'm alive forever and ever. I have overcome death. You might be facing death, but I have overcome death. <laughs> and I hold the keys. I hold the keys of death and of Hades. They're in my hand, says Jesus. No one else holds the keys of death. 
He holds the keys of death and Hades. The word Hades is, is not the equivalent word to, uh, to Gehenna, to hell. It's the equivalent word to the Old Testament word Sheol. And uh, it, it's in, in Old Testament belief. It's the place where departed spirits went to. It's the place you go after death. And he holds the keys. He holds the keys. So if you're facing the possibility of death, <laughs> that's huge comfort. But notice this. Notice the promise is not that they will avoid death. It's the promise is not that they will avoid going to court and being tortured. It's not that they will not be executed. The promise is that on the other side of death, Jesus, who has conquered death, will be waiting for them. So the promise for you, the fact that he holds the keys of death, he holds the keys of your death and of your life, the promise is not that you're going to live until you're 95, 120, or whatever. You may do. God may bless you with a long life. But the promise is this, that when death comes, whatever point that's at, however young, middle-aged, or old you might be, when that comes, it's in his time, because he holds the keys, and he's there to meet you. He's overcome death. He's there to greet you, to meet you on the other side of that because <laughs> he has overcome yeah. he has overcome and if you have that confidence to quote Beale again if you have that confidence in Christ's sovereignty that he is in control that he is in charge that helps guard us, those that read this letter against despair and against the compromise that goes with despair. Let's think about that for a moment. I, just a couple of moments to pause here. Let's think about these statements here. I'm the first and the last, the living one. I was dead. I'm alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. For you this morning, here in West London, in January 2010, what do those promises mean for you this morning? This is about testimony. What do those promises mean for you this morning? There's two or three people. Suddenly, a raft of hands. As we proved already in our family, basically what we really need to do is rest, as I said already before, rest in God and forget about the world or anything else. Mm -hmm. And trust God. Okay, thank you. I saw... Um, it shows us that we, sh we don't have to fear death anymore because Christ has conquered it. And if we die, we die in the Lord, no matter what happens. Okay. Amen. Did I see your hand right at the back? Could you have sat any further away? <laughs> it's all about the past program, I think. <laughs> For me, I think that, there is, that uh, it means there's more, there's more life, abundant life, even after that. Abundant life after death. The reason that Hannah's sitting right at the back is actually she's going in and out doing something else as well. So it's a bit unfair for me to pick on her for that, really. So she's doing something else for me at the moment. So. Oh, it's a big statement, isn't it? Last one. For me, I can put it on, only in one word. Always I have hope in him, whatsoever the circumstances. Because mm -hmm. he is the most triumphant. Hope in him, whatever the circumstances, he is the most triumphant. I like that. Final two verses this morning. Right there for what you've seen, 
what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This here is uh, John's commissioning. As he is being told, begin to write this letter, write what he sees. As I've said, holding the stars is about political authority. This statement that the seven stars are uh, the angels of the seven churches, uh, there are two different possibilities, and you can take your pick. Some Christians believe one, some believe the other. Uh, some people see this as picturing guardian angels, that each church has a celestial being, a guardian angel, uh, looking after the church. I quite like that idea, actually. I quite like to think we've got a guardian angel. We certainly need a guardian angel. Some people think that it's, it's simply a way, uh, like some of the images here, of just picturing that this is the church's before God, held before God. It's comforting either way, but, you know, you can, you can take your choice. But this is the key thing. It's in his hands. The stars are in his right hand. The destiny of all is with him. So as we begin to pull these things together this morning. I'm going to ask you in a few moments' time what the key things that we take away from this morning. I, uh, one last quote from this writer, Boring. The response of John was the response of one who recognises that he cannot traffic casually with the Almighty. You know, sometimes Christians think, other people think, but Christians sometimes think they can play fast and loose with God. It'll be okay. I, can, I know this isn't what God wants me to do, but, but I can do this. It'll, it'll be all right. Or when God is speaking, uh, they develop selective deafness. Those of you with children are all about selective deafness. <laughs> but this response of John is the response of someone who knows you cannot play loose with God. Because he's not just gentle Jesus, meek and mild. This image here is as true of him and how he is among church. So, final question this morning. I'm going to pray for you in a couple of minutes' time. Uh, final question this morning. What are the key things? What are the key things we take away from this passage that changes our relationship with God? Because it's not enough just to hear some bits and pieces and think, oh, that was very interesting, Pastor. Pastor got very excited this morning. It's not enough. If it doesn't actually leave you changed, you've not heard God's word. Do you hear me? If it doesn't leave you changed, you've not heard God's word. So what are the things we take away this morning? For me, it is that God is a powerful God, and um, he has all the power to do what he really wants. Um, he's a merciful God, and yet, um, if we are disobedient, he can also, um, his judgment can be upon us. But at the same time, he's a loving and gracious God. For me, I think I need to tighten my seatbelt now. This is not the time when I can let it loose because this is 2010. Mm -hmm. Time is getting by. Thank you. Live each day if it's your last. Mm -hmm. uh, 
in whatever circumstances we may be, he is in control, he's in charge. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry. That when God gives us a charge, he's serious about it and we should also take it serious because he has given us a charge as Christians, we have a tax ahead of us and we're supposed to work at it in faith. Lastly, although, <clears throat> sorry, although he's most high and full of awesomeness, but he's near to us. Mm, very good. Very good. As I was uh, finishing my preparation, there were, there were three things that seemed to me to be the key things that I took away from this. This reminder that Jesus is actually Lord of all. You know, no matter how big things seem that we're facing, Jesus. <coughs> is Lord of all. And that our response to difficulty sometimes needs to be patient endurance. <laughs> and that finally, Jesus has conquered death. He holds the keys. Let's stand together. Let me pray for you. I'm going to give you a moment or two to make your own response to God. There may be something you want to say to God uh, between, just between you and God, not out loud. Uh, if you want to do that, this is an opportunity to do that now. And then I'm going to pray for us together in a couple of moments. But first, a moment of quiet for you to make your own response to God. I saw one like a son of man. Dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet. The golden sash round his chest, his hair and head were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And he said, I'm the living one, the first and the last. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Father God, for us this morning, for all of us who are here, those who are watching this on the internet, for every one of us, I want to ask that you will continue to reveal yourself to us. Open our eyes open our spiritual ears that we see more and more what you are really like in your awesome glory, your transcendence, your majesty, your otherness. Father, help us to know that you hold everything in your hands. Whatever our situation, whatever our circumstances, whatever it is we are facing, that you hold it all in your hands and that you work for the best for us. So, Father God, we commit ourselves into your hands this morning, confident that you are working from the first to the last in our lives, confident that we are secure, fully and completely and totally in you. Father, work in us and through us and help us wherever we are this week for our light, the light of our bit of the lampstand to be shining out at home, at work, at school, at college, with our neighbours, with our friends, with our relatives, wherever we are, that your light will shine undimmed through us. In Jesus' name, amen.